Amen. God bless you and welcome to another show of the Brinson Institute coming to you from the Christ Family Radio Network that is good for you and your soul. We're just so glad to be with you on today, another day that the Lord has made and we're thankful and grateful for what he's doing in the land. We just celebrate that God has been, is just good to us and we're happy that he has been blessing us and doing great things in our lives. So we what we want to do today is continue and our broadcast and we have been sharing together and God has been blessing us and uh, great things have been happening uh, in the ministry and I thank all of you that have been calling us and sharing with us and dialoguing with us. Those of you that want to continue to stay in contact with us, you can just look on our a look on our on the screen there and dial us up. Give us a call at 773-616-1951. Give us a call and uh, share with us. Those of you that uh, want to check us our website out and see what we do and see what we're about, just come on and do that. Well, some of you all, we're just giving some of you all time to come on in and let everybody know that the Brinson Institute is on the air. So if you would do me a favor, as I ask each week, right on your phone, on your tablet, if you would hit your share button, just hit your share button so you can connect me with some of the people that you share with. Can you do that? I'm going to hit my share button, and then we're going to get started. Uh, so we're just excited about what God is doing, and we bless him because we know he's able. So, as we continue in the book of Revelations, we are now coming to chapter 1, and we're beginning now to read verses 9 through 20, and as we begin uh, chapter 2, uh, for this part, we're going to be talking about the churches, the message of the church at Ephesus, and if we can finish it up, we're going to try to do Ephesus and Smyrna today. But let me say something about the seven churches. Uh, as we talked about it, remember now as we prepare on these seven churches, we want to go with the flow of the theme. Remember now that the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, which we're going to talk about are the leadership. We say to the angels of the church, we're talking about to the leadership of the church. Isn't that something that the angels of the church, the seven stars was in his hand. So as we talked about it last time, that the leadership, God's leadership, his leadership of the church is in his hands. He decides and decides and appoints people to participate in the body of Christ. So the seven stars represents the leadership of the angels of the church. And back in those days, they didn't just have one pastor or just the senior pastor. They had what we call a, a combination of leadership. They had elders who worked together, and they had a, different elders that came together, and the church was led by a leadership team, not just one person or the head person or one charismatic figure. So when we say to the angel of the church, of the given church we're talking about to the leadership of that particular church right. And so it's the angel of the church or the leadership of the church was responsible for reading, teaching, and training those which were members of the church. So when he wrote to the angels of the church, then he's talking to the leadership of the church. I'm giving you this information, this revelation, this prophecy of who I am, so that you may teach the people that are part of the body of church, which is the church, so that they also can teach others. So there's always been in the process of Christ's church those persons who lead, teach, and train to equip the church. That's the leadership of the church. All right, the seven candlesticks, the seven golden candlesticks sticks that we talked about. Remember that the seven golden candlesticks are representative of the church. Each candlestick represented a church. The candlesticks were lit for light. It said in Christ walked, he was walking up and down among the candlesticks. So as we talk about each church, we're going to be talking about Christ's activity in each church. We're going to be talking about what Christ saw in each church. We're going to be talking about the message of each church. 
We're going to be talking about the meaning of the name of each of the churches. We're going to also be talking about the character of each church or what was prominent of what each church was signaled out for and what was it that Christ wanted each church that had its own uniquenesses but yet made up to some totality of the things that was in the total church. We're going to be talking about the title. Each church uh, Christ gives a title of what he was doing or who he was. So for each church, he talks about how he is represented by each church. And each church, he's going to talk about the good points of each church. And then in each church, he's going to talk about some of the faults of the church, what they need to improve upon. And then he's going to talk about the rewards and the I and the overcomer. So there's going to be a reward. So in that, we're going to talk about the commendation. He's going to talk about what should go, what happens. He's, he's going to talk about the complaints, what I have against you. He's going to talk about the counsel that I want to give to you uh, and the warning that you need to look at. Uh, we're going to talk about the promise to the church, the character. And now also what I want you to do is take a look at it. What we're going to be talking about as we take a look at these seven churches is we're going to look at what? These churches also represented a period of time in the history of the church. What do you mean by that, Apostle Branson? Well, you know that uh, the Gospels were written in the 60s and the 70s. Paul comes in and he's writing in the 60s and the 70s. And the scriptures like Corinthians and Thessalonians and all the Old New Testament scriptures that we read, we, what, we, what do we do? We apply that to the church today, don't we? We apply that. We say in God giving some gifts and some he gave apostles. We just don't say that was for the church then. So some he gave this and he gave the gifts of the church and, and we talk about how we read our scriptures and we meditate on our word. And so when we read the word of God, we find information in the word of God that God is speaking to us right now. Is that true? And some of our grandparents and great-great-grandparents that's gone on, and some of those who live in, in 300 and 500 and 750 uh, A.D., and those who live in the church in 1200 down to the 1500s, some that was in 1965 all the way up to 2019 to going into 20, the word is, has some sense of application to our lives and it has always been with the church down through the church's history. So with that in mind, we're going to say that each of the seven churches also has within it a unique period of church history whereby during the history of the church down through these years we found that the church was challenged, had some issues, some concerns about what was going on during those periods of time periods from since the church was formed in Acts up until now. Certain generations and certain times the church had to deal with certain issues. At the same time, the things in the church general also was in the church specific and certain things that was specifically related to certain churches in certain geographical areas was also related to the church as a whole. So we got to keep that in mind. So when we say the church ain't this and the church ain't that, sometimes you have to understand because your particular church ain't this or there's a couple of churches or your particular denomination ain't this and ain't that that there are other churches that may have some of the same issues, but at the same time, Christ said on this rock, I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell may come into it, may come at it, there may be attack on it, but no matter what goes on, whether you've been hurt by the church or whatever, that does not give you an excuse not to be a part of the church. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord, you are part of the church. And for you that's all into this kingdom stuff and ain't about the church, you that's the spirit of the Antichrist because Christ is the head of his church. So when you talk about the church and you're negative anti-church, you anti-Christ. You cannot be anti and against the church that Christ set up and built and is coming back for. He didn't say, I'm coming, he said, I'm coming back for a church. 
I'm coming back to rapture the church. I'm coming back for the church. So regardless of what the church go through, regardless of how you feel about it, whether you go or don't go to the gathering, gatherings, Paul said, don't forget to assemble yourselves together. So whether you are caught up, I'm not caught up in the denominations or address or whatever, you need to be participating and in covenant with the body of Christ in some kind of way. Do not isolate yourself. Find out where there are groups of people meeting and find yourself participating and meeting in covenant and relationship with members of the body of Christ, the church. Now, the church has a, has a place where it meets. The church has a place where it gathers. And so, therefore, when we do the study of the seven churches, we're talking about those people of the body of Christ who were gathered in that particular city that were dealing with issues in that particular city but they were still the church so when we say the church of Ephesus we're talking about the believers who were part of the body of Christ who was God's church who lived in that region called Ephesus so each church is in a geographical region that's being challenged by some cultural issues, some political situations, and some circumstances in that geographical area, but yet at the same time, they were related, and each church, no matter what geographical area it was in, also had a little bit of each church's situations, challenges, and promises. So we want to keep that in mind as we go into the seven churches. So remember that. The candlesticks. Christ walks in the midst of the candlesticks. The candlesticks were symbolic of the church. It was lit. So we see that in, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, Jesus says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill. The body of Christ. The light of the world. The candlesticks. The candles burning. Jesus given the power to sustain the light of the world. So remember that. It says, and then in Acts chapter 13, verse 47, it says, For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. So the church is set to be a light for the Gentiles. The church is set also to be a light for those who walk in darkness. The church is set up to be a light for those who don't live the light. So while we point and condemn folk, we have to be the light to shine because the church light is to influence the communities at large. So the question is, as we talk about the seven churches, where do you see yourself? You're going to see yourself in each one of these churches we talk about. You're going to say, oh, that's me. That's my church. I experienced that. Oh, I can see that now. So remember, Christ walks in the midst of the candlestick. So he's walking up and down in his church and giving the power for the light. So keep that in mind. So remember, Ephesians, Paul writes to the church of Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. And he says, for ye were sometimes darkness. But now ye are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. So as members of the body of Christ, the church, we are challenged to walk as children of the light. Why? Because in Philippians chapter 2, verse 15, Paul writes to the church of Philippi and says that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. So that we as members of the body of Christ, we need to carry ourselves in a certain way where people don't be pointing at us and talking about us and downing us. And uh, we have to bring problems to people and say, well, I thought you were supposed to be here. You're supposed to be. We should not have to be rebuked and challenged about how we live and how we do as we call ourselves and are members of the body of Christ. We must see ourselves as the church in the middle of a perverse nation and amid of all kind of rules and regulations and new laws. We still have to let our light shine because Christ walks in the middle of us. The kingdom of God is in us and we are the body of Christ and Christ gives us through the power of the Holy Spirit the power to become his sons and daughters. So you're going to see this thing. So 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 5, 
Paul writes to Timothy and he says what? Ye are the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So therefore when you see night and darkness, don't be so excited to be complaining and frustrated because what? The light shined in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. So Christ always brings light. That candles always brings light in the midst of darkness. So in the revelation, each church is a candlestick. And Christ walks in the midst of the candlesticks. And the seven is symbolic of a whole. So it said to the seven churches, it's saying to the whole church. But then as I write to the whole church, each unique church has some unique situations that I want to talk about. But it's just not just unique to that particular church. It's a part of the whole church. So there are some, some, some character issues in the whole church, represent each church. And there is, and as we look at the whole of the church, we're going to see Christ and his various, his various attributes, his various titles. We're going to see the various good things about the total church as simplified in individual churches. And then we're going to look at the false and the rewards. So that's how we're going to be looking at the seven churches, which is symbolic of all of the churches that was representative of the churches during that time. The letters that uh, the testimony of Christ wrote by John as Christ set his prophecy and said, write these letters and send them to the seven churches, also included all the churches of that time, but specifically sent to the seven churches because the things that were going on in those seven churches in Asia Minor were also indicative of the things that were going on in the churches in general. Are you with me now? All right, so write this letter send it to the churches. I got to have a testimony. This is the testimony of Christ. I'm the head of the church. These are my churches. I walk in the middle of the candlesticks, which is my churches. I am in the midst. I'm in the midst, walking in the midst. I'm doing certain things in each church. So when you see what I'm doing and put all the seven churches together, you're going to see and note uh, the character of the total churches, the title of the total churches, the good points of the total churches, the faults of the total church, the rewards and the challenges and the promises of the total church, while we look at individual church, while at the same time we take each church and apply the uniquenesses of that church to a period in church history. And every time we add a period in church history of one of the churches, guess what? Those things of the history by before that is still going on. So we keep adding up history. We keep adding up history till we see all parts in ninth in 2019 when we complete all of the component parts of church history where we are today will be a reflective of everything that was going on in all the churches, even back in John's day. So I want you to write these things which are and which shall be to come. I am Alpha and Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. I'm the first and I'm the last. And so as we approach then the revelation to this process, remember, one, two, three, four, five things. Five words I want to give you as we look at this text and as we begin because the Bible says, blessed is he that what? Read it then. Hear it and do those things that are in the book. Read it, hear it, and do those things that are in the book. Like I said, in those days, they didn't have a lot of books. So they had the leadership, the angels of the church. The letters was written to them. They were responsible as the angels of the church to read it to the congregations of the people. Lead the reading. Listen, discuss it, talk about it. Read it so they can hear it, talk about it, understand it, and do it. So there are five things in this process. Number one, revelation. Revelation was the truth that was given. The truth that was given, we're going to call it the revelation. I'm going to write this revelation, the truth that was given. Now, 
there has to be an inspiration to a revelation. Because a lot of people, they will get a revelation, which is the truth given, but they don't record it. The scripture said, write the vision, record it, write the vision. But you need inspiration once you receive a revelation. So we go from revelation to inspiration. We have to be inspired to record it. Uh, to record it. It's got to be put down, put it down. I got a revelation, well, you got to have inspiration to put it down. Revelation without inspiration does not bring the fullness of revelation. Well, I got it all in my head. Ah, get inspired. There needs to be some inspiration. So, uh, the holy men of God wrote as they was what? Moved by the Holy Spirit. Prophecy come not but old by the will of man. But the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. There was some inspiration there to speak it and write it. The scribes write it. Write the vision. So, revelation. Uh, that's truth given. Inspiration is truth recorded. Now, once I have inspiration on my revelation, I need to have interpretation. So, you know, I can have a revelation and have an inspiration. I got truth given, truth revealed, truth put down, and truth wrote, but nobody interprets for me. The, the man that was coming, the, the, the unit that was coming, on, on the desert reading from the scriptures and, and the evangelist uh, Philip said do you understand what you read there's a revelation there's an inspiration of it being written down but then do you have an interpretation of what you believe so we got to have truth given revelation uh, truth recorded inspiration we need to have truth expounded interpretation that's why we have to have teaching of the word, preaching and teaching of the word, dialogue and discussion of the word. There has to be some expound, some exhortation, prophets, prophecy, exhortation, to expound on the word. So we have revelation, truth given. Huh? We have inspiration, truth recorded. Then we have interpretation, truth expounded. Now once you expound and teach and train me, and break it down, then I have to have application. Truth applied. So how do I take the truth that was given, the truth that was recorded, the truth that was interpreted, and now how do I apply it to me? What difference does it make? How does it apply to my everyday life? How do it apply to the body of Christ? How do it apply to others? What is the application? Revelation, inspiration, interpretation, application truth given truth recorded truth expounded truth interpreted then you have one more truth understood truth understood do you understand what thou readest then he took the scriptures read it and then explained it to him and then he understood truth understood that's called illumination ah I now understand. Ah, I can have a revelation, truth given. I can have inspiration, truth recorded. I can have interpretation, truth expounded or explained. And I can have application, truth applied. But I need illumination now because now I understand it. I just don't apply because you told me this is what I need to do. I understand now what the text is saying. So this is how I want you as we begin to make a presentation to you to have a biblical understanding of Revelations, the introduction, the overview of Revelations, the first chapter, and also to the seven churches. I want you to receive the revelation, truth given. I want you to have inspiration. I see that John had inspiration because John wrote it and he recorded it through inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, we're going to come with an interpretation, and that's truth expounded. And there are many types of interpretations, so you got to be careful. And then we're going to talk from interpretation to make an application of truth applied. How do I apply it to my life? How do we apply 
this revelation to the churches, how is it applies to the church I'm in, how it applies to those church, those members and the body of Christ I'm a part of, then how do I apply it to me because I am a member of the body of Christ and so I represent also Christ's church as well. I'm a member individually and particularly, but yet connected. I'm individual, but yet I'm corporate. So sometimes there's a word, there's a corporate word, there's an individual word. Individual words make up corporate words, and corporate words say something to the individual in the word. So I need illumination so that I can understand. And so when you understand that, you put that together as we look at that. So as we begin to do these seven churches, there are three basic things also that I want to leave with you as we talk about and as we read. We want to talk about observation. That means we're going to gather the facts. We're going to read the facts. And when we do that, that means we have knowledge. So observation means to get and gain knowledge through gathering the facts. That's one. The second gate I want you to work with is interpretation. So to interpret means that we're going to examine the facts that we gathered. And once we examine the facts that were written and we gather, then we must understand. All right, we must have an understanding of the facts that we, that was explained to us based upon interpretation. And then the third gate we're going to look at is application. How then do I apply those facts? And the application of facts is wisdom. So now, are you with me? And all thy getting of knowledge, get an understanding. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Because wisdom comes from getting an understanding, and understanding comes from having knowledge. Knowledge, wisdom, understanding. Got me? Knowledge, gathering the facts. Understanding, explaining the facts. Wisdom, applying the facts. Knowledge, wisdom, understanding. Observation, interpretation, application. So I'm going to observe gather the facts, and have some knowledge. Now I know. Now I'm going to interpret what I've observed, and I'm going to be able to explain the facts that i gathered, and now I'm going to understand what I know. Then I'm going to put those two together, and after observing and interpreting the facts, now I'm going to apply the facts to observation, application. Observation, interpretation, application. Now I'm going to gather the facts through observation. I'm going to interpret the facts through explaining the facts. And then I'm going to, uh, through application, I'm going to apply the facts. Got it? Then the third part of that tier is knowledge. So observation and gathering of the facts is called knowledge. Interpretation, explaining the facts is called understanding. Application and applying the facts is called wisdom. I pray today that the power of the Holy Spirit will be with you as we enter into this discussion so that he that readeth it, heareth it, and understand and do what's in the book may understand and receive a blessing. So let's go now into that. We've gone through Revelation chapter 1, and now we're going into chapter 2, the message to Ephesians, to the church of Ephesus, which is the church of Ephesus, which is the same church that Paul writes to in Ephesians. Now remember, we said the Gospels and the letters of Paul was written somewhere around the 50s and the 60s the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s to the church. The church was started around what? 32, 33, 34, 35. 10, 20 years later, we got the Gospels and some of the letters of Paul's epistles to a church that is already 25 to 28 years old. Now, the church is now when we write now, the book of Revelation is written in the 90s. So then now the church is about 60 years, 50 to 60 years old now. The church has been established 50 to 60 years old now. 
And John gets a revelation from Christ who sends letters to the church in Asia, which represent in our representatives of the church universal during that time frame, which was about uh, 60, 50 to 60 years old. Are you with me? So, okay. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things said he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Remember, each church that we talk about is going to give some action of what Christ is doing. So Christ is telling the church at Ephesus, you know what? I, 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 I have the seven stars in my hand. I have the leadership of the churches in my hand. And I'm walking in the midst of my churches. I am actively involved in my churches. You need to understand that when we talk about the body of Christ, Christ's testimony of himself is saying, I, I didn't just go away. I, I'm, I'm here. I'm walking up and down in my churches, and I have in my right hand the leadership. So don't get it twisted. So to the church at Ephesus, the prophecy of Christ's testimony to his churches is to let him know, I'm with you. I know I'm with you always, even until the end of the world. I got my star leadership in my right hand, and I'm walking up and down in the midst of my golden candlesticks, my church. Now, because I do that, I want you to know something. I know what's going on in the church. Don't act like I don't know what's happening. He said, I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience. Now, some of us, we feel like, well, God, do you know what I've been doing? Do you know what I've been working? I've been doing all this work. I, I come, I'm laboring. You know, I, I have a lot of people been put up with this. This one did this to me. This one did that. Hey, Christ is saying, as a member of the body of Christ individually, as a member of the body of Christ corporately, I already know. You will call, I shall answer. The whole time. Before you speak, I say, here I am. I know what's going on. I know I, I, I'm, I'm there. I'm, I'm, I'm walking up and down in the churches. I have leadership in my hand. Well, I, you know, no, no, touch not my anointing, do my prophets no harm because I know what's going on and they're in my hand. That doesn't give us license to do what we want to do. God can take care of vengeance. is mine. I repay. God knows what he needs to do. It's his leaders. He's the one that called them. Our job is to confirm what he called and get with the program. Some of us, we just don't get with the program because we caught up in our own issues. We caught up in our own culture. Can women do this? Can men do that? Now, God called you when you male for me. You can do what God said. Well, my church, well, the church you at, the place, there, well, then you better move and go somewhere else because obedience is directly related to your blessing. And Christ knows what's going on. And he has the right leader for you. He has the right church for you because he's walking up and down. And he knows the works of his churches. He knows the labor and the patience, and he knows that thou cannot spare them that are evil. I know that. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles. Those who say they are apostles, those who say they are leaders, you tried them. And you got enough sense through the power of the Holy Spirit in you to identify the false prophets and the real prophets. So Ephesus. The church has a way of understanding through the power of the Holy Spirit to identify false prophets. If you're not a member of the body of Christ, how can you identify a false prophet? The letter wasn't for you. I told you that these letters was written to the church. We have so many non-church people always trying to identify false prophets. How can you identify that which is false if you don't know and understand that which is true? You shall know the truth. The truth shall make you free, set you free. You cannot be free to make an evaluation on what is false until you accept that and live that which is free. There are two truths, one with a capital T and one with a small t. Your truth is your reality. I'm not going to argue your truth. Whatever's happening to you, however you feel, that's your truth. Your truth is your reality until the truth or what Christ has to say about it is connected with your truth, then we don't know the truth. So the truth comes from your truth and Christ's truth. 
So I don't care what the community say. I don't care what laws are passed. I don't care what they say. That's their truth. That is a truth. Small T. But the truth is God's word. And it's the truth that heals, delivers, and sets free. Okay, I know that you have found those who say they're apostles and are not, and has found them to be liars. That you have actually, in the body of Christ, if you're around sound doctrine and teaching and understand truth, you will soon discover those who are liars, false prophets, and got these positions and titles, and they're not, they're not that. The Bible says in the last days there's going to be false prophets and false teachers. So they're going to have different titles and positions. But they're going to be false. They're not going to be teaching the correct doctrines. They're not, and, and that the church is not going to give heed to sound doctrine. They're going to believe a lie instead of the truth. So we have that. So, you know, don't get upset. It, it is what it is. You're just supposed to let your light shine. What are you doing about it? How are you influencing people in your community, in your job, in your family? And thou hast borne and hast patience for my name's sake. And you have labored and have not fainted. All these are the good points. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. Okay, so let's look at the church of Ephesus. Number one, the meaning of the name Ephesus means to let go. That's the meaning of the word Ephesus, to let go. The meaning of the name. Uh, the period that we're talking about, we said we're going to look at the period in church history. So we're looking at around the book been written about 95, 95, 96, 95, 96, somewhere around there is that it writes to the church, to the things that is. So the church of Ephesus would also in church history represent the first part of church history, of the church in around 96. And then the character of each church. Well, the character of the church of Ephesus will be representative to loss of first love, that your effort, you know, you got relaxed. Somewhere you was doing this, you was finding out the liars, you was doing all that, but you lost your first love somewhere and got off. Your effort was relaxed, and uh, the title that we see in Christ identifying himself in this church is that what? He walks in the midst of the candlesticks. He have the, the, the stars in his hands. So we know that we, we, he got all in his hands. And then you know to my church, I got it. I got you. I got you. Your good points is I see your labor and your patience. That's your good points. But your fault is that you left your first love. And so the reward is in, if you overcome, you shall have paradise. You're going to eat of the tree. Back to the garden of Eden. The, 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 Adam, he was put out of the garden. He was put out of paradise. But now when you eat of the tree, the tree and the new Jerusalem and the new, and the new earth, you're going to be able to be there and you're going to eat again of the tree of paradise. So, so it says, uh, but thou hast had, that, but this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitan which I also hate. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, who were the Nicolaitans? Because you're going to see that again in one of the scriptures, or one of the, one of the churches. The Nicolaitans. That was, a, you know, the, the question is, when you do some research of, of where did that come from, there's been some, some discussion of the Nicolaitans. And if you do a study, some of them, the, the whole spirit of uh, the teaching of Nicolaitans, the Nicolaitan spirit is in our church today. The Nicolaitan spirit says, it's about your spirit. We're spiritual people, and you can do what you want to do as long as you're spiritual. You can live in your kind of way. You can have sex with anybody. You can do all as long as you are spiritual. It's about your spirit. It's about love. Just love everybody. Be spirit. That's the, that's the Nicolaitans doctrine. It has to do also with sexual perversion. And it's also tied into the doctrine of Balaam. And the doctrine of immorality. And so therefore, we have to understand that it's a sin. Well, you can eat, sleep, and be merry. Eat, sleep, and be merry. Uh, you can eat food, sacrifice to idols. 
You can do what you want to do. You can worship stuff. You can, you can have your little altar in your house with your little gods. You know, God is here. We can just, no, that's the spirit of the Nicolaitans. Keep that in mind. So this Nicolaitan spirit is in the church today. So they teach also a perverted grace. Well, no matter what you do, God's grace will cover you. No matter in all Paul says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Even though his grace is sufficient, his grace will cover you. That don't mean you can just keep doing what you're doing and say, God, thank you for your grace. By grace are you saved. It ain't by works. Sometimes you got to, Paul said, you got to show me your works as well as what you believe in. Grace of God covers us. The grace of God comes to the multitude of sin. He washes us. He cleanses us. Thank God for his grace. But some of the teachers teach perverted grace. You can do what you want to do. Do it however you want to do because grace got you covered. That's the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Some of y'all Google it up. Look it up. What is the Nicolaitans? Uh, some of them. That's self-indulgence. Leading a life of self-indulgence. Uh, abandon yourselves and and just just have pleasures to your own desires. Do what you want to do, however you feel like it. And as long as you come and jump and shout and just worship Him, Jesus Christ, the Lord, Hallelujah. We worship You. So you come, you have good worship service. You don't stay for the word. You have a little worship service. You live in your kind of way. But just come and worship. It's my spirit. My spirit. I just feel it in my spirit. Oh, we have the spirit. The spirit is so high. The spirit. It's all about the spirit. No, it's about how you live. It's about your character. It's how you act. So the doctrine of the Nicolaitans has something to do with also the spirit of Balaam. The doctrine of Balaam. That's denying the true faith and just having part of the faith. I'm half in. And, you know, so I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to commit sexual immorality. And it's all right because God loves everybody. And that So that's the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Do you have that? Now, just for information, uh, in one of the studies, if you study it, uh, some people will say, well, you know, Brinson, if you go back to Acts chapter 6, verse 5, uh, the one of the deacons full of the Holy Spirit is mentioned there when um, uh, uh, they said separate us some people full of the Holy Spirit and so one of those persons was Nicholas if you look, look at that Nicholas was one of those persons who means one who conquers the people Nicholas means one who conquers the people. So it is said that Nicholas, who was one of those full of the Holy Spirit that was listed of the men in Acts chapter 6, verse 5, uh, became apostate. He, he denied the faith, and he started teaching uh, wrong doctrine. He started teaching false doctrine. And he said, well, you can eat meat, sacrifice to idols. You can live immoral. You can do what you want to do as long as your spirit is connected to God. And so he started teaching that doctrine. And as a result, in his name being Nicholas, those who began to follow his teaching was called the Nicolaitans. So when you do a study, you'll probably find that in your study somewhere. It's going to come up. I just want you to know that that is out there. That is one uh, one interpretation. But the other interpretation is that the word, the Nicolaitans, come from the Greek word, Nicola, means let us eat. Eat to be merry. Let us eat. The, Epicure uh, the spirit of the Epicureans. Uh, eat, drink, and be merry. Have a good time. Sleep with whoever you want to sleep. Do what you want to do. Party. Hey, party. Hey, go out, do your thing. But just make sure on Sunday you come in and you, you pay your dues. Get your little dues. You do your worship him. You come in, do your jump and shout. But then you're going to do your party. That is the spirit of the Nicolaitans. Are you doing your happy so Jesus commends the church of Ephesus for hating the deeds of the Nicolaitans. As he said he did. So therefore, the leaders, he's writing to leaders and said, you all been doing a good job. You've been preaching against that spirit in my church. 
I don't like it, and I'm glad that you don't like it, and I celebrate that you hate the spirit of the Nicolaitans. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said unto the churches. Plural. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now, I told you, for those that talk about symbolism, you need to go back into the biblical text and look in the Bible to see if it's mentioned somewhere. Where else is the paradise is mentioned? Two or three things. But Jesus said to the man hanging on the tree, this day, he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He said, this day shall thou be with me in paradise. So we know there's a paradise. Paul said, I was caught up into seven heavens to paradise. So we know there's a paradise. Jesus even talked about Abraham's bosom and paradise. And so the garden, the, the, midst, the tree of life in the midst of the paradise of God is also symbolic of in the Old Testament. It talks about what? And God planted a garden. God planted a garden. Go read Genesis. God planted a garden. And put the man in the garden, which was God's paradise of Eden. Eden was symbolic of a paradise of God. Planted the garden, put man in the garden, and told him he could eat of the trees of the garden. But the tree of the knowledge, good and evil, he should not eat of. Because the day he eat of that tree, he shall surely die. Then what else he said? We need to put him out of the garden. Because unless he take hold of the tree of life and live... Then they were put out of the garden, and an angel, Seraphim, was sent to protect the garden to keep Adam and Eve from getting back into the garden and eating off the tree of life. So therefore, when we talk about the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God, that is Old Testament symbolic of the New Testament, of the new Jerusalem, and the new heaven, and the new earth, that will have a paradise, and the fruit of the trees, is and the leaves of the trees, is for the healing of the nations. So we're going to keep that in mind, and have that as a part of what we do and what we understand. So you got me there. Are you there? So now, let's look at it. So now as we look at that, we're going to see that Ephesus in itself was, let's take a moment and talk about Ephesus at its height, was an important city along Asia Minor. It was one of the important cities. There were about 230 cities along the coastline of Asia Minor. And they had many had uh, ideal harbors, but and boy, in places of relaxation. But but Ephesus uh, was like the queen among all the coastline cities. You all see travel, and you know, it's something about water and boats and coastline. It brings what tourism and entertainment. So so Ephesus was a city that was rich and covered with rich. It was a great commercial city, like Chicago, a great commercial city. It was along the coastline. It had a natural harbor. It was a, all the main roads of the travel of the main roads went through Ephesus. In fact, all of the seven churches, if the seven churches, he said, I want you to write and send these letters to the seven churches. We're going to look at the geographics of each of these seven churches and the cities they were in. They was along the main highway of travel, of people traveling all over the world. They used the main highways. The main highways of travel, commercial, uh, economics, uh, the law, the political power, the powers that it be, where people came and congregated and lived and, and had good times and worship and whatever, was along the main highways. And Ephesus was one of the most first prominent cities along Asia Minor, along the main highway. It was in the middle, then uh, it, was a, it was a kind of height of trade. The height of trade. And so therefore, in the height of the trade, Ephesus also was known for its great religious center. Because it also was known for the great Diana. Great is the Diana of the Ephesians. It was a place where the religious cult of Diana was. The temple of Diana. And the goddess of Diana. And you know what's something about that? The goddess Diana, if you look at it, had a gross head. Had an ugly head. With many breasts. That was the, the sensualness of Diana. 
the goddess Diana. And so what happened back in them times as it began, there was a great trade of silversmiths. And so the silversmiths began to develop over the years and tourist, uh, the tourist commercialism, people came to see the big temple of Diana. The silversmiths, the economic people, the money that they was making money then because people started learning how to do silver to make these idol gods of these little figurine statues of this ugly grotesque face with many breasts to celebrate Diana and the fertility god of who she was. And so, and all this superstition and all this religion. So they went to the superstition and all this religion. If you go back to Acts, remember, that was when Paul and them, they came and they took their books and they burned them in the city. Remember that story? That's tied into what was going on in Ephesus. Ephesus, so it started out with a small beginning when Paul visited Ephesus and only found 12 people in the city. Way back, only found 12 people in the city. And, and, they, and they were kind of immature because they had found Christ by the teaching of Apollos. So Apollos had went to Ephesus and taught the scriptures. He didn't have it according to knowledge. He had 12 little members. Paul comes to Ephesus, find those folk. He started teaching in Ephesus. There was open door, remember? Oh, come over to Macedonia, help us. Open door. And many, and so the Jewish people start fighting him. And what did he do? He moved and he started teaching in the synagogues. And uh, he taught for three months, and the Jews was mad at him. They wanted to fight with him. And what happened? And then he moved his church into the, 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 the home of a school teacher, which was a philosopher, uh, Tyrannus, the school of Tyrannus. So he started what we call the school of Tyrannus, and he preached for two whole years in Ephesus. That was during that time when the church was instrumental and in signing the word through Asia. Let's go back to Acts chapter 19. You'll see that. The word of God in both Jews and Greeks. And the Lord worked special miracles by the hand of Paul. And witnessed witnesses, some, and amazing. And those bought their stuff in. And there was a lot of things. There was a lot of oriental magic and superstition and emotional, sensual, and sexual sins. And people were all into their feelings. All that people were devoted, and they were expressive people. They were loving people. They they loved people. They was and it was that kind of people that Paul did. It. But here he is, twenty years later, ninety ninety five. Paul was in there around sixty seven years, and twenty years later, uh, some things is happening. They're really into some stuff. The church is growing. In fact, that was in fact, if you study it, John the Beloved, who was on banish on the Isle of Patmos, thirty miles outside of. Uh, Ephesus, that was John's home church. And that also was the church earlier where Paul had assigned Timothy to be uh, one of the pastoral leaders of the leadership there. So you see how that tie in. I want you to keep Ephesus. Ephesus, think Ephesus. Think the book of Ephesians. Read about what Paul was doing in the 60s and 65 when he was writing. Then go back and read the book of Acts and find out what Paul and some disciples and how they related to Ephesus. And that gave you a general idea and overview of this was one of the churches. This was, was a, gen, a Gentile church. It was Christ himself. He was speaking to that church. And so the, 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 the message to this church was a message that Christ was involved and he was walking in the midst of the church at Ephesus. And he knew that they was committed and that they was all into it. They was trying the apostles and leaders. They was checking them out. They was identifying the false prophets. Uh, don't we have that today? Don't we have churches that have sound doctrine today? Don't we have churches that have patients and they labor, they're in the communities, they're working, they're checking out folk. They just not ordain anybody. They're holding people accountable. Isn't that, don't you see the, 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 the church of Ephesus today doing that? You see churches that's all excited. Some of us say, you know, I was excited when I first got this thing. I would do this, but you know what? Now I used to go here and go there, but now I miss this. I'm not as faithful as I used to be. I'm not as really in it like I used to be in it. Why? Because I've lost my first love. I need to go back and pick up and get active like I used to be. So this is what Christ is saying to Ephesus. I need y'all to get back to being like y'all used to be. You, 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 you good, you good, you good, you good, you good, but you're not the best. You kind of slipped off a little bit. You, you, you kind of let it slide a bit. I need you to get back on it. 
You know some of us, you know, you, some of us in our own ministries. We, you know, when we first started our church or our ministry, our Bible study, we first started coming to a church or whatever, we was excited. We was on everything. We was just involved in a lot of stuff. So things start happening. Things in the community, things around the people we ready to. We got everybody to check, whatever. And so now we, you know, we love, we still love God. We still keep it to mind. We still doing stuff. We still can identify a false between from a real. We around for, we can tell you, but we just don't do it like we used to do it. We just don't do it in the strength of what we need to do it in. We just not strong like we used to. So we have lost our what? First love. Our first excitement. I want you to uh, do. I want you all to really hear hear what I'm saying. Hear that. Hear. Let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. I need you to overcome. I need you to overcome that. I need you to get that together. Because when you do that, overcome and get it together, you're going to be what I need you to be. And so this is what the Ephesians. And so we look at that. So we'll go back now. Let's so let's let's summarize the Ephesians, Revelations. Chapter two, verses one through seven. The meaning of the church of the church Ephesians means to let go. The period of church history was around 96 AD. The character of the church was that it, it its effort was relaxed. It had got relaxed along the way. The title of Christ as identified in that church was that he walked in the midst of the candlesticks. His church he had the seven stars in his hand. The good points was they had labor, they had patience, and they had good works. That was a good point. Their faults was that they left their first love. The reward was, I need you to overcome. Get back to doing what you got to do. Go back and be active. Get your first love back. Because your reward is that I'm going to let you eat of the tree in paradise. So, you see how simple that was? Was that hard? That was so. That was hard. That wasn't that hard, was it? So thank God for the book of uh, the Church of Ephesians. So we're going to come next time and deal with Smyrna. For those that are watching us and continue to watch us, we want you to be blessed. And we thank you for what God has been doing to you. And until next time, go with God and be blessed.